No, I'll never hold back. I assume that's why I've been dragged onto this once and for all. <laughs> <laughs> to give to give a platform to the to the hitherto voiceless. No, it has it, a misery is the watchword. Um and, and this has been a, a miserable week, uh, without a doubt. Um on uh Thursday, uh we got a we got a lovely message from NHS Track and Trace uh, telling us that someone uh, in this flat and I mean I've had many interesting flats uh, over my time at the uh, the University of Glasgow some of which uh, you know it's been a pleasure to share with with uh, with, with good company but uh, when I say we've wound up in a in a in a crack shack in the commons in Mary Hill we we really mean it you know like uh, <laughs> we've fallen from grace quite uh, spectacularly and this is sort of the final nail in the coffin is uh, uh, you know I'm having to come back and and get uh, you know coronavirus basically this is actually one of the things I, I wanted to discuss sorry was that um, by law obviously if you're living in a flat like that and someone contracts it you do have to go back and self isolate because you could have been exposed to it. Mm. Um, but even if you hadn't contracted it previously, you're still required to go back sort of thing, um, right. yeah. which I think is a problem because obviously I've had to come back and, and now almost certainly have it, um, you know, because it's mm. an airborne pathogen and, you know, uh, I, I may not have the disease, but I'll certainly have the virus uh, aspect of it. Uh, so obviously, you know, full compliance with the law, but, uh, <laughs> you know, this is something obviously that... Uh, uh, well, from a personal standpoint, I'd, I'd obviously, uh, you know, wanted to be very careful about um, my, my uh, well, I, I remember the initial stages of, of lockdown. If you don't mind, I'm just thrusting into anecdote. Is that okay? No, no, I don't even quite, think you've, don't even think you've, don't even, don't, don't even think you put a, like, a strict question before me, no, no. but no, um, I, uh, I no, uh, my, my life is, 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 is just, you know, one set of uh, misery uh, to the next sort of thing. And at the beginning of, um, well, just before the lockdown, you know, there was, sort of this this brief moment of peace uh you know we were enjoying it and and whatever but obviously as soon as we did go into lockdown i was back home uh, for a bit and and both my parents are, are public servants my dad works in the nhs and obviously it was drilled into us massively you know that it's it's not hard wear a face mask you know sanitize your hands you know the world was obviously clamoring to respond to this uh, global pandemic and and i think the glam uh, the, the granular response there was was pretty robust uh, so that was certainly something i took from it and that you know like that that was a a testing time for everyone but i think it's it's obviously a very simple thing is uh, you know like sanitize just be careful you know mind your p's and q's etc it's not that hard if everyone pulls together so i was a bit mortified uh, when when you know uh I, I got that message and i had to return uh, to this to this flat because um i i yeah no i, I wasn't sorry it's not cutting me out is it i'll, I'll, I'll stay as close to the to the microphone as possible yeah I mean, because I, 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 um, I'd also had, um, you know, because obviously we've gone into a circuit breaker lockdown and everything. And also, sorry if I'm not being focused and to the point. I tend to get quite tangential. I've got, sort of, I, I've, I've got a sort of, I've got, I've, I've got a senility, uh, a pre-senility senility to it. Uh, but, but yeah, um, we obviously, you know, things were beginning to return to normal for a lot of people in some ways. The circuit breaker lockdown, notwithstanding. Uh, one of my pals had come over from from Germany. Um, I hadn't seen her obviously since the beginning of the lockdown, so we'd hosted her here and everything. Um, and yeah, and no, just the ramifications that proceed from one person obviously making a faux pas are are tremendous. You know, um, <laughs> uh, I uh, you know obviously stuck in here until the twenty third. It's it's going to be a hell of a time. I think the the flat is in. Um, well, it, it's it's uh, it is where it is, um, you know, and that's and that's the law and everything. But um, uh, the way I put it to, um, to 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 hold on, let me cross that out, go back onto Telegram. But the way I put it uh, to, I think uh, someone earlier was was like so. Um, uh, here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes. Uh, uh, Sanitizing one's hands, wearing a face mask, and not going for an impromptu shag to Dundee aren't codes of behavior to master, I shouldn't think. Uh, this is not a pointed remark in any way, shape, or form. Uh, yes, no, it's 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 obviously it's it's it it is where it is, and and you know I'm trying to adjust to it. I, I you know like I don't particularly like being in here. The room in this this flat is is unlike anything I've ever known. Really, um, the walls are very thin. Uh, they have ears and uh you know as much as an exhibitionist or a voyeur might enjoy that like for 10 days and potentially feeling a bit peely it's 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 going to be a test of 
uh, of even the most robust personages uh, endurance sort of thing. But no, I'm, 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 people have brought me groceries. I've been very touched by sort of the, the outpouring of support. And there is a real sense of community there. And it's, it's, very, it's very rare that I actually uh, get serious about these things. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's certainly brought it all, all, all home for me. So yes, in short, my week has been bloody miserable, particularly miserable, more miserable than usual. But, but here we are, we're sitting with, um, you know, half a glass of, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a uh, Bujule uh, village, uh, which I think is some Bordeaux wine or whatever, half a glass of that, a miserable mug, um, and, you know, just a bit of existential ennui, which I imagine is the same for a lot of people uh, across Scotland uh, tonight. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, this has pressed a lot of people, put a lot of people in some unique circumstances that they definitely didn't expect. Very mm-hmm, busy mm-hmm. times. Um, so yes, that was a great introduction, I must say. Incredible. Probably one of it's the... It's a bit of a f- flabby opening gambit. I love that. I love that. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I want those tangents and you better keep them flowing throughout this conversation. But mm. I also want people to know who you are. So would you like to introduce yourself? I hate self-promotion in any sort um, of capacity. And unfortunately, that's just the adult world into which I seldom fit. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, I would stick, obviously, with the, the uh, you know, perhaps the most miserable person in the United Kingdom <laughs> uh, label. But uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Rory Mullen. Uh, I... Uh, I'm a fourth year student of English literature at the University of Glasgow. I hate, you know, like the self advertisement, you know, like, the sort of, you know, like, cause it, it, yeah, like uh, there's no fanfare to it. It's, 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 it, but, but yes, I, I um, in, in short, uh, at, at, at the moment, I, um, I'm in my sort of final year of uh, study at Glasgow University. Uh, I'm uh, doing a few other things uh, beside that. I'm running a, Glasgow-based theatre project at the moment, but of course, mm-hmm. all theatre and shite has gone up the Swanee, so uh, we don't really expect to see anything more from that, etc. Um, and and yeah, no, I suppose I'm, I suppose technically a published uh, poet at the moment, um, and I certainly have very uh, <laughs> very specific views that I tend not to share, uh, that that I imagine are, are sometimes quite out of step. Uh, uh, but but you know. Um, yeah, that, 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 it was like doing an icebreaker thing. I usually just shut up and miserable. Um, I am who I am. If they ever make a Wikipedia page, you know, I look forward to it. <laughs> Isn't that the dream, having a Wikipedia? That is the dream, exactly. It's the mark having arrived at something, is, yeah. is having you know, your Someone birth to death. your legacy for you. That sounds oh, yes. Um, so, yeah, you said you, you are currently studying. You are. Mm-hmm. You have a, a theatre-based um, drama esque project on the go. You're mm-hmm. a, you are a poet. Mm-hmm. Anything I'm missing here? And and you've got coronavirus. in 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 inverted commas. Because again, this is the thing. Yes, and I've got coronavirus. You know, I'm joining the ranks of 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 of, of the high and mighty uh, who have had this disease, sort of thing. Uh, yeah, no, uh, these are all like, um, these are all labels that I can be quite resistant to. Also, you're, you're, you're cutting it kind of a bit. I'm going to check the bandwidth because it might be on my end as well. Am I still fully audible? Yeah, you're perfect. On my yeah. Um, yeah, no, these are, these are all sort of labels I resist, you know, like self-identification with these things is, 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 is hard for me just because I don't know, like there's just still this like very strong sense of West of Scotland, like don't promote yourself. Don't. Mm. That you can be these things, but you to actually label or accept it as those things is kind of hubristic sort of thing. Yeah. But there's no shortage of that, obviously, in in university culture and whatever. Everyone is singing very loudly for their supper sort of thing. <laughs> uh, and I'm a timid little man, so I don't I don't particularly like to stand up and say, you know, like I am this and I am that. Like I'm all things to all men most of the time. <laughs> uh, so I just, I sort of stick with that. But yes, I am, I'm published and everything, whether it's poetic or not, is really up for, for anyone else to debate and whether it has any performative merit again is, is very much up for, for, for grabs. Uh, I just, I, I do things occasionally um, and, and, and that's it. Uh, I think um, I'm gonna peter out now. So uh, your, your poetry is published. When did you start writing poetry? Is this something you've always been doing? 
No, it's not. It's full of, I mean, yes, but it's all been very private. It's always very, very right. private. I don't like sharing any manner of cultural experience, uh, which is, which is, yes, which is not, it doesn't make for the happiest sort of bedfellow with this sort of term poet, which is where you are supposed to, to share, you know, your, your human experiences and whatever. Yeah. But I've had very unique human experiences or lack like thereof in, in many ways, which mean that it's sort of very hard for me to, to open up about these things. I, I think if nothing else, like I do offer some, you know, unique perspective on, on certain matters. Cause, um, uh, well, the, the, the original, you know, sort of call to arms in a sort of poetic sense, cause I mean, like I used to have a little journal where I'd write something, but I would never share it, you know, like I would just, cause I knew it wasn't good enough sort of thing, you know, like I'd decided that if it couldn't rival Keats or Spencer or Pope, then it really wasn't worthy of any critical attention. You know, like I hold myself very firmly up to all these personages and greats. And, mm -hmm. and if I'm not hitting the nail on the head sort of thing, you know, if I'm not, you know, channeling or, 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 or you know, creating a style that's lofty like that, then I kind of just sort of flagellate myself and say, well, don't fucking write anything. And I mean, that's generally what I would say. I mean, if God forbid, if I go into teach English, that's what I'll be saying to the next generation is just stick that up your ass because it's tosh. But of course, people need to learn. People need to, you know, build that resilience. And in a lot of ways, I didn't do that when I was growing up. You know, like um, I, I didn't really put my work out there. I didn't get it judged. Uh, and yes, I can be quite sort of sensitive to criticism. And in the end, you know, like I have found this style that's certainly very unique and emotional, but all of that has been very much locked uh, away for a long time because I've never seen fit to, to open up about these things. But now, obviously, that I'm a bit drained. I've decided, well, you know, we can all jolly well hop it and I'll try it anyway. And um, I don't know, it's been very, I think when I do do it, it it's, it's usually sort of um, in a performative way. Like it has a lot of performative gusto. Like it has to almost be a, uh, a matter of life and death for me to to sit up and do it. And I remember very distinctly being told uh, by the, the English teacher, um, you know, like, why don't you try and write, you know, poetry when you've got like lived human experience? <laughs> and I just never really had that because a lot of my young life was running from any manner of human experience, not any manner. I knew friendship. I knew what it was like to have a wonderful friendship. And indeed, uh, need I invoke, you know, Mr. Mahi Mustafa, who is, of course, uh, you know, one of the most beautiful men alive, et cetera, and, uh, at, at, you know, at whose feet I fall and simp, et cetera. You know, like one of the modes of human experience I understand well is a very strong male friendship. But I had never at any point in my life, really up until like 19 or 20, understood romance, understood, you know, sort of sex and sexuality, that this is a very sort of divorced part of my life. Uh, and so when she said, go out and get human experience, I assume that's what she meant. Go out and, you know, try life, love in the universe for a bit. Uh, and of course, when you are a jumped up child like me and you put me in sort of the middle of a university culture and yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. And that was what compelled me. That was what got me, um, you know, eventually to go and sort of, you know, and I mean, it was embarrassing. It's still embarrassing, you know, because, uh, you know, there are, it, 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 it's, um, but but I think certainly for those who have like it is it it's 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 unique if nothing else I hope you know like there's not quite uh, anyone who reacts to these things in in quite the same way like it's a flicker for me like it's a brief flicker of a humanity that I've been running from all the time when I stand up at a microphone and eventually speak about these things that I've been keeping so private about myself because all the conversations that you have growing up like the sharing of human culture like I'm sharing this song with you I'm sharing this album with you I'm sharing this film with you etc like I I only really shared with one other person and it wasn't of course in a romantic way it was in a sort of best friend way and then at 19 there I am sort of split open and there's all sorts of other social forces and there are all sorts of other ways in which you can share but that's why it hurts me a lot to share and that's why it was quite powerful to do it for the first time that's why it's so intense um, and I don't know. I reckon the people at In Deep and the Parlour and all these West End pubs got to fucking run for their money seeing this sort of, you know, Victorian figure come up and scream for the first time, you know, a bit like Catherine Linton at the window in Wuthering Heights, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, no, it, it became a very literary experience for me in the end, um, which, you know, all life should aspire towards, etc. I hope that's a, a comprehensive enough answer. I'm going to take a sip of water, haven't I?
That's a great perspective to have. I, it's not a way I've ever looked at things. And the way you're talking mm. about it is so, I mean, you're painting the picture so, you're articulating it so well. It's, it's brilliant to hear you talk about this, actually. Um, I, I hope it's not going against exactly what you're saying by finding a struggle to articulate humanity by talking about this, but it is exactly what you're doing and it's brilliant. Well, I, I do it I do it now because, you know, I'm yeah. sort of convinced that there's, there's, like, even though it's happened at a very delayed, you know, and it's happened in a very delayed way, you know, like, um, the, there's no point in going through your life sort of indefinitely, you know, shielding from all human experience. Like, you have to learn at some point and somehow. Um, and really, unless, you know, you're chronically disabled or whatever, or have some sort of, like, no one can run from it, you know, like, we are continually growing, we're continually developing, and and that goes even for, for lost, forlorn souls, etc. cetera, um, <laughs> such, as, such as me. Um, but yes, um, yeah, I don't so know if that was a... Have to sort of uh, evolve with it, or, mm -hmm. or, or give up and be lost to the void, that's our options. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. Um, so poetry though, wh wh when did you start writing poetry? Do you think when? What's the earliest point in which you would consider what you're writing down to be poetry? I've never considered it poetry, just to, to be clear. Because I, again, I'm very poncy and very specific about what I do consider poetry. And in fact, I used to be very robust in those debates. Like I have a very traditional schema uh, for for what counts as poetry. And you know, like I put a lot of, for me, the, uh, I, I can tell you what isn't poetry to me. Like, that's what I can more strongly articulate. I mean, I do, I remember actually going in, I mean, because I bloody well shouldn't be in an English literature course, but that's everyone's business these days. But um, things that, that aren't poetry, you know, like just someone, you know, standing up on a mic and slamming out words and stringing that together, like it can be poetic, but it's not poetry. Like for me, right. poetry has a more sort of specific, uh, you know, uh, like scansion or prosody, like it has a more specific form. Um, like I can be quite traditionalist in that. Like I like poetry, for instance, obviously, and particularly poetry within the English language that has you know, a, a good rhythm and a good rhyme, uh, you know, um, something that, that, that has a stable meter and, and stable rhyme, uh, and that just kind of speaks, uh, that, well, in, 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 to me, certainly, that, that, that is beautiful. Like, that is what, to me, is beautiful, having grown up in something like Glasgow, for instance, where the world isn't very literary here, you know, the world isn't very uh, mm. beautiful in that sense. So that's a, a, that's a form of exquisite realized in verse that, that, you know, sort of bam talk and, you know, like that sort of racuous, harsher speech could never lend itself to. So of course mm. that's poetry. It's, it's absolutely for me to decide there, I think. But of course you go to an English literature course at the Glasgow University or Edinburgh University and it is, and I use this term in, in, in a lot, uh, yars, you know, like very sort of well-to-do English people that of course I've grown up in that, who have grown up in the cult of, um, of you know Spencer and Roger Kipling and, and all the English greats and whatever and are sick of it and therefore they are attracted to the more sort of working class verse just to give themselves kudos or just to you know give themselves like respectability or look at us we're reaching out and we're you know engaging with other forms of, of style I think it cuts both ways but certainly for me like I, I am attracted to the verse forms that are more ornate that are more that, that come closer I think uh, to me uh, in realizing sort of metrical sonic uh, uh stylistic and just yeah sort of perfection in in like across the board sort of thing and and that even goes for poets that i don't like i i for example despise john milton i think he's a surly prick but he still writes these wonderful wonderful verses i mean his politics are just abhorrent but the opening lines i remember to, to paradise lost where it's like of man's first disobedience and the taste of that forbidden fruit um whose mortal taste brought death into the world uh, it's not rhymed or anything, but it is, it's blank verse. It's like iambic pentameter. It's just a beautiful read. Mm. It's beautiful to sound it out. It's beautiful to read it on the page. You play that against something like Kate Tempest, where someone essentially just stands up and goes, yeah, basically this man put his cock in my fucking bum. And yeah, this was really bad. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't see that. 
I don't see that as being relevant. Like I don't see that as new because I could do that myself and it just really wouldn't have the resonance. Like to be honest, she's just a pro with a microphone. <laughs> but, you see what I mean? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yep. You do the comparison perfectly. <laughs> like the idea of literariness isn't just one that's constructed, like it's true and it holds firm. I actually believe, and I think it is correct to say that those who dismiss like conventional literariness are only doing so because they're running from essentially their own backgrounds, yeah. essentially, you know, like that idea of it because it's become jaded, because it's become, you know, uh, like anathema to them in some ways. But that truer sense of literariness, I'm sorry, was the only thing that sustained me living in a part of this fucking miserable city where everyone talks like this and no one has a fucking basic literacy level and you know like you're just surrounded by you know bams unbounded like i'm sorry but that is a refuge i wouldn't be so you know nippy about it perhaps if social forces from which my parents worked so hard to shield me hadn't been in play but it is glasgow and you know you must ask who in glasgow is actually touched by literariness very few people thinking of Mahi Mustafa right now. And by the way, I'm not claiming to either, you know, like I'm touched by a performative literariness. It's been a while actually, since I've been able to sit down and properly appreciate things because my mind gallops apace and runs wild now mm. because, you know, I'm in a constant state of anxiety. But we'll get to this, sorry, by the way, like I don't, I don't like making, you know, too many bones about it. I don't like opening up about it in the same way that obviously a massive part of, you know, the university culture does, you know? Um, that's something I'd like to come to. But just to, to sort of recapitulate the point, I think there is a definitive kind of literariness that I'm attracted to and I believe in. Um, and I just, I wouldn't want to see that die. Um, it gets bound up, obviously, a lot of the time in debates about colonialism, imperialism, and whether these poets are relevant now. But, you know, there is beauty to be found in all of these works. There are universal human truths um, that can be captured so well in, in, in these older works. And I just think, you know, why, why would we run from them? Why would we try and rearticulate that? Why would we try and paste over it with essentially more hackneyed and sloppy work? Mm. You know, I don't care for basically much poetry, you know, beyond the, the 80s, you know? Like, I think there's a lot of truth and, and beauty to be found in, in, in the history of it, you know, because the human condition is kind of unchangeable. Like what changes obviously is how the societies that we live in work um, yeah. and whatever else, like the material conditions change, but, you know, like fundamentally, you know, what we crave, what we seek, you know, that's very much all locked in the earlier verse. And why should we disregard that if there's a more powerful articulation of it to come from the greats and the ancients? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, sorry, would even include like a canon of English literary greats which of course we tell place about in a Glaswegian system, but you know, like, unfortunately we speak this language. It is very good. It's quite a nice little vehicle. It might not be middle French, but it's quite handy. I wonder if I've got uh, Alexander Pope to, to, uh, to actually to hand, because he is, um, he's one of the authors that just, you know, absolutely does it for me. Like, I remember, uh, you know, like, Again, I'm not, I'm not one to make a fuss about my own living circumstances or whatever. Like I'm quite Victorian, I suppose, in a lot of senses in that I don't, I don't ever, I don't ever sort of not stand up for myself. I can be quite bad about that as well. Um, but I don't, like I just get on with it, you know, that you just kind of have to get on with it. Like I see that as a sort of British sensibility, like shut up and just, you know, do it. And I remember like, sorry, living at home and coming into the campus, uh, like on a bus. And of course, buses in Glasgow are just filled with <laughs> miserable bastards <laughs> that are going to disrupt your reading and your concentration. But the only respite, you know, that I would get from that sort of thing would be in the works of, say, uh, Pope and the other satirists from the early, like, 18th century. And I just remember, uh, just looking out for the, for the moral essay, there is, there's a poem that absolutely, you know, stuck with me. Uh, called Windsor Forest. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, which is uh, this pastoral, uh, panegyrical, uh, topographical poem um, that the Pope writes uh, during the reign of Queen Anne, and it's uh, it's to do with um, uh, 
uh, th th there's a, a, a massive continental war that Anne brings about peace to. It's the war of the Spanish succession. And it just, it, it, like, it's just, it's so perhaps conventionally beautiful, but I, I, like, just because it's conventionally beautiful doesn't mean that it should be written off. I'm just looking for this beautiful couplet and then I will stop and, and let you get on. I think it's, there it is. And at length, the great Anna said, let discord cease. She said, the world obeyed and all was peace. I mean, it's pish. And obviously the woman was fat, had 17 pregnancies and, you know, didn't really achieve that much. Wasn't really an astute politician, but the way it's formulated, like mm. it's beautiful. It really is beautiful. I don't care if it's untrue. I don't care if it's trying to paste over the cracks. Like We know a lot more about this woman now, but I just think the idea of this fat, lisp and lame woman like bringing peace to Europe is, is a powerful one. Mm. Um, and, and I just, yeah, like that takes me out of the, of the laboriousness of the minutiae of the, of the sort of total disaffection, frankly, that I feel with, with today. That's me done. <laughs> the, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to create a podcast in the first place is because I really love hearing people uh, talk about things they're passionate about. And hearing you speak about this right now is, is, um, is exactly what I wanted from this podcast. It's exactly what I wanted. I wanted to hear people like yourself talk about things that you, you are enthralled in, you're, you're engaged in, you're, you're immersed in, and everything that you, you're mm -hmm. talking about. That's exactly the way that I... This is incredible. Thank you. Um, I would like to go back to an earlier note. When mm -hmm. you said that you don't think that you should be uh, studying, uh, or did you say you don't think you have the right to study English literature? Or no, what? I just don't think I should be doing it. Like it would have okay. been a hobby. It would have been a nice hobby on the side. It's now become a full time career, uh, which is uh, which is not right. Yeah. No, I did. Um, I, I again uh, in the in the spirit of sort of confessionalism, uh, I ended up in an English literature course because. Um, I had a very strong friendship in school with someone um, and I remember I'd done this pre-entry teaching qualification uh, and I could have gone into I don't think actually I would have been seated for primary school teaching that would have been a bit miserable I think <laughs> anyway um, but uh, my pal uh, who, who went to Edinburgh to do a degree in theoretical physics um, he was you know telling me you know do a proper degree <laughs> um, and I remember I got the, the higher English award and whatever and I'd done obviously very well that year um, and I don't know like I was kind of just sort of cajoled into, um, not cajoled, like he never told me to go and do it, but it was this emphasis on a proper degree. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I couldn't do uh, English, it's just that obviously I hadn't quite grown up in the right uh, culture for it. I mean, it's not that we didn't read. I do like plays and I do like poems, but I wasn't getting through a novel a week where I grew up. You know, there wasn't a huge passion for fiction. Like, yes, there was definitely a, uh, a literariness, yes, there was definitely uh, an interest in, in language and in words, but how far that could extend plausibly, how far that could go, particularly when it's, you know, brought up against people that have had perhaps more opportunities there, uh, was, was, was sort of any man's game. So yeah, I ended up in this course and, you know, it was not, was not right. I mean, the syllabus also at Glasgow University is bollocks. Um, just to be completely honest, but I don't really speak up for these points anymore. Like I just really need to grit my teeth and get through this year sort of thing um, with, with, you know, as with as much as I, I can sort of thing. Um, I mean, it's very much tied into obviously my, my lack of a university experience as well. I mean, I didn't, my parents never saved uh, for me going to university. So I didn't have any money. I arrived at 17, you know, I was in a course potentially that wasn't right for me. Um, I could still do it and you know in in the end of course like obviously got into honors and you know i'm i imagine a, a capable chappy but it, it came obviously at an extreme cost because there were all sorts of holdover issues that i've kind of alluded to already like holdover social issues in that here was someone that i'd spent my life with up until like 18 gone to edinburgh you know gone forever so not forever like but the change yeah. the the material change in my that, yeah no completely it shook me i mean obviously bad move to just put all your eggs in one basket mm -hmm. sort of thing but that's how much a creature of loyalty and purity that that i am mm -hmm. um and yeah no to be thrust into an english literature degree where obviously you know it's full of people that won't 
frankly, like should have been told to shut the fuck up a long time ago. Like, um, yeah, it, it was tough. It was not an easy environment. And I also, I should say, I did a lot of my hires in in the sciences and in mathematics sort right. of thing. You know, I could have gone another way with this. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I kind of spun the wheel at the end of school and thought, well, you know, here's a positive leavers destination. We'll go in and we'll do it. I think the way I put this to people before is that it's kind of forced me to adopt some sort of literariness in my own life. You know, right. like I've been... Uh, very keen to recoup a lot of moments that I would never have had in in the south side of Glasgow, and there have been absolutely moments like that. There have been these wild trips to Venice. There have been um, other trips, you know, that you know, because I never really got to travel growing up either, just because of the family setting and whatever. You know, I'm very fine and very anxious and very difficult, and I certainly can't do a novel a week. But when I do, you know, put pen to paper, it, it, if I do say so myself, it tends to be very good. It just it takes a lot of time to like authorize one's right to speak mm. uh, because there are all these foibles that have come from school and, you know, that have come from, you know, growing up in a part of the world where it's not exactly like, <laughs> it's not exactly like you were having, you know, like meaningful literary or philosophic discussions and growing up, like it was simply enough to, you know, get through a day of school and pass your exams and do well, frankly, to be, to be okay, you know, essentially in that department. You know, that was a, a hallmark of, of having done something. Um, the shift uh, into a university culture was was tough um, and not one that I've, I've fully mastered. Um, and yes, I've blown all my chances to, to reorientate myself. So I better just get my head done and, and, and do it sort of thing. It will certainly be a very, very entertaining moment uh, if I do graduate, perhaps with a 2-1 or a first in a degree that was never right for me. But that, I think, is the only way that I have any hope of, of, of realigning myself academically or, or whatever, uh, which I would like to do, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately. Like, I'm really glad that balls of pasta salad have made me an expert on the Earl of Rochester's closet dramas, but more and more I query, you know, what, what is this achieving? <laughs> what, what, like, where do I go with this sort of thing? So, yeah, there are lots of other things that I would like to do. There are lots of other issues that I would like to speak up on, you know, like I for instance, you know, have a very keen interest in, in politics, that perhaps that was something that, that, that I, I should have thought about. I think my place ultimately is in a humanities or a social science. It's right. just I've ended up in a full-blown arts degree, and uh, it's, it's a test. It's a test. It's, it comes into the writing. It comes into the speech. It comes into to everything. But I hopefully will, will you know, uh, bear with it, get through it, and uh, Who's to say where we'll go uh, from there? It's it's been you know like a huge impediment in many ways, but um, mm -hmm. you know as I say, trying to see it as constructive because that's the whole positive mentality pitch that we're supposed to adopt these days. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I hope that's again a comprehensive answer. I'm gonna wish that. Yeah. Um, another uh, side note that was mentioned earlier was uh, your perspective on uh, what was it? People speaking about their their anxieties. Uh, yes. What, what were you going to say on that? I'm sorry. Like um, everything that I've outlined to you, like um, I went to 1920 and shut my hole, you know, zipped. Fucking, if you're getting a meal, if you're getting three meals a day, you've got fuck all reason to complain, you know. <laughs> um, I think these are very sort of first world problems about like I need a safe space, I need a fucking like fuck off. Fuck off. British society is unfair, you know, and we've all clocked this. I really don't need this pish. Yeah, okay, great. You know, like some people feel uncomfortable, but these are, uh, you know, problems that I... Like everyone has mental health problems. Everyone has anxieties. Everyone has these things. Of course they do, you know. Uh, I wouldn't want to downplay that, but I often feel like it's co-opted, particularly by those, frankly, who have the resources to deal with it. Because I'm sorry, but like, uh, it tends to be obviously that the more resources you have, the better able you are to address mental health problems, you know, that you'd be able to perhaps look for private ther therapy sort of thing. Like that was not something I got. So I think like a baseline level of sort of, you know, um, I suppose just pulling your breeches up is what I want to say, uh, would be helpful for everyone. Like, I don't think indefinitely you can you know, you can absolve yourself of responsibility, you can absolve yourself of, of the need to contribute in some way. 
uh, with with an infinite spiral of, of mental health. Yeah, is a thing. You know, I recognize that now. Mm. It's taken me out a bit, but at the same time, everyone should want to serve. Everyone should want to contribute. Everyone should want to uh, do something, like to offer something in whatever way they can. I don't think that's draconian. You know, I just don't like how it's been co-opted a lot of times by people, how it's often used, you know, as a smokescreen, um, uh, you know, for, for essentially, yeah, for, for other things, you know, like, great, let's talk about it. But, I, and I'm not, sorry, insinuating that we should go back to, I don't know, sort of, um, again, Victorian England, where, you know, you're not allowed to discuss these issues openly. Like, yes, have healthy discussions about it, but you can't use it as an excuse for everything. You can't, like, right, yeah. you know, like, that's what I mean. Like, there's being too open about it. And I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, like being a leaky cold sore. Like, you know, like, you know, you don't want to annoy the fuck out of everyone. Like, yeah, uh, in, in, in an ideal world, like, you just want to have a conversation. You know, like, mm-hmm. everyone is going to have their own, uh, you know, struggles. Everyone is going to have their own, um, their own battles to fight, and 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 yeah, it's healthy and productive to discuss that with your therapist. You know, but <laughs> you can't use everyone as an emotional crutch and whatever. Like, it's much more healthy in friendships and in all relationships, really, to to have discussions that aren't just about mental health. Like, it still should be quite a delicate and shielded thing. I think. I see, I see. You know, like I, I think it's an intimate thing to talk about mental health mm-hmm. in that way. You know, like to talk about your mental health is to open up to someone, I feel. Yeah. You know, um, and I don't know, just on the point of it, like um, one of the things was uh, I was in the um, uh, the Glasgow Uni Student Representative Council elections and everything. Uh, and obviously everyone takes a really firm stance on on mental health. I just, I, I also, again, have a lot of skepticism about people who loudly champion like mental health concerns. Again, like I have... I have sort of a creeping suspicion that there's a lot of charlatanry going on uh, right. in the, you know, like these people will probably never be touched in the same way by mental health concerns that like, yes, it's all well and good for them to stand up and, uh, and take a, take a firm line on these, on these issues. But I think, you know, like it, it, it helps to have some sort of experience with it, like to understand it properly, like to have a proper sense of empathy before you talk as, loudly and pretend to understand sort of other people's experiences in that way so that was one of the things that annoyed me about the hustings sort of thing um so in summary i don't want to close down discussions altogether but like for people who yeah. are genuinely mentally ill like like the moments of pleasure the moments of enjoyment are going to be those moments where they're not thinking about their mental illness they're not thinking about how defunct they are they're not thinking about you know like yeah discuss it sure but just don't let it dominate and don't dwell on it as much as you know like yeah yeah no i know i know it's hard it's certainly hard for me like my mental processes are all askew at the moment but like i enjoy myself a lot more when i'm not thinking about mental illness i'm not thinking about anxiety or depression or these terms or i need to get medicated like one of the most fortifying experiences can just be you know to slowly but surely just work on how you feel like like it's it's sometimes yeah I, I don't mean to put up like that but sometimes like it's all in you you know like you've got to pull your breeches up and find something that works for you there's only so much that other people can do i, I mean that doesn't seem like a completely mm. outlandish mm-hmm. statement to make really it mm-hmm. seems deeply rooted in thought you've thought this through and it actually to me makes a lot of sense i'm not, I'm not gonna lie when you started off i did get a bit worried i'm i was thinking oh god what's rory gonna say this sounds very uh, controversial, but now that you said it, it seems completely rational. It's, you, I agree with you. It, it is a, it's something that it's sort of spoken about mm-hmm. <laughs> so openly now that it almost, <coughs> I don't know. That is a bit strange. I don't know. I, I think I, I think the ones who are trained best to speak about it are the ones who like have the best resources to respond to it effectively. You know, like people that will never talk about their mental health concerns, for example, are like I don't know, like working. I think of all the working class Glaswegian men. I think of like all the like hyper masculine men that have never been able to air that out, have never been able to have like a forum to discuss these things, who just get on with it. You know who just like pull themselves together sort of thing you know like 
I don't want to call it an indulgence because it's not, and people should talk about these things. But at the same time, there are people like who work a lot harder, you know, who are like fucking up at six o'clock, you know, like whippets going into hospitals, like genuinely struggling, genuinely suffering, genuinely who would have a right to talk about having mental health problems. And they don't, you know, like I feel like there needs to be a bit of a perspective shift. If you're a university student, for instance, yeah, you're struggling probably. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. But at the same time, you know, if you can get a fucking Uber up University Avenue or if you can get an Uber Eats to your fucking flat, like it's hardly the same as being, I don't know, like a fucking frontline healthcare worker. But it's hardly the same as, you know, people in all sorts of disparate sections of society who frankly, like obviously do <laughs> very demanding things, like perhaps more demanding things than, than you and might have greater struggles with mental health, you know, but the ones playing the mental health card and not to call it a card in that way, because obviously it's genuine, but the ones who speak most loudly about it, you know, are, like are, are less affected, if, if that makes sense. I want to say uh, this is this is a lot of this comes from like personal experience of people who need to talk to mental health uh, to me about mental health. But yeah, I just think the ones that have the monopoly on talking about it uh, are the ones who you know know how best to address it, how best to air it out. You know that they can often come off as like sermonizing. They can often come like you know they can talk down to people who haven't been trained to talk about it. Like we need to kind of accept that not everyone is on the same footing when it comes to talking about these issues. Like people obviously grow up in different places and, and whatever, and people do different things. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if I'm being completely coherent there. I just, I see it mm. a lot on the university campus and I just think, well, <sighs> is it as justifiable for you to you know, take that line when, you know, mental health doesn't just affect university student, it affects us all, you know, mm. like no one um, gets off from that. It's not something I've thought about mm. Mm -hmm. much to be honest I've just took it for granted mm -hmm. it. just talk about it if you have any problems just talk about it and it's just sort of mm -hmm. rained in me at this point that that's the way it should mm -hmm. be but I suppose mm -hmm. you're right in many ways because if I broke my leg I wouldn't expect my friend to fix that for me mm -hmm. just as if I had something severely wrong with me mentally if I had some sort of something mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect them to fix it for me either I no. go to professionals for both of those problems and I guess that's the way it should be and also I, I totally agree with you actually on the on the point of that the people with the loudest voice aren't usually the ones with the best experience and that seems to be the yes for a lot of things across the board the people that speak about um uh race problems the people that speak uh -huh. about homophobia or 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 any or any sort of political problems any sort yeah, of yeah are, are the ones that are empowered beyond that category absolutely. exactly absolutely yeah I, I definitely think that's the case i mean I and then they cast themselves as weathercocks they cast themselves as people who speak for that category you know like i just yeah. don't like that at yeah. all. i mean i've spoken to countless people on on the subject of um sort of like uh, racial or, or or appropriation racial appropriation um, mm -hmm. and most people who are willing to give a sort of in-depth, uh, like analytical perspective on it, are people not of a minority. It's mm -hmm. the, minor the people of that minority, most of the time, oh, I from my personal experience, are like, I, I don't really mind. I don't mind. And I guess it's, that's the case with most things. It seems like the people that have the loudest voice aren't usually the, the most the ones affected proportionally yeah, by these issues by no way. completely yeah. look yeah yeah you know this is this is it like i'm sorry like if i can get your uber to your black lives matter protest yeah mm -hmm. like while well, the rest of black people in glasgow do fucking you know like daft jobs percentage wise like proportionally you know wouldn't have time to attend those protests etc like mm -hmm. it is I don't want to play into it. Like it's, it's not all virtue signaling. I don't want to use virtue signaling in that yeah. aggressive way. You know, like I don't want to run the risk, obviously, of sounding like a right-wing commentator. But again, it does tend to be, you know, people that have had all these opportunities and, and they've never had to deal with these issues, you know, be that like across race, sexuality or, mm. or, or gender, or any of these things, uh, any of these sort of cleavages uh, who tend to have the loudest voice on it, you know? I would also um, and it's, that mm -hmm. if, if you are one of those people who uh, experience mental health uh, mm -hmm. issues and are vocal about it, I'm not saying that 
you have no right to be vocal about. I'm just saying when there are those people who don't have any problems, but then speak mm -hmm. on behalf. I suppose it's quite like mansplaining. Everyone knows what mansplaining mm -hmm. is. Yeah, yeah. Exactly that. Some idiot is trying to tell you something they don't really know very much. And uh, mm -hmm. if you are a, a minority and you don't agree with cultural appropriation and you don't like it, then I completely respect your opinion on that. I, I, I am not saying that I'm, I, I have no opinion on it per se. I, I'm more, I, I don't think I actually should have an opinion on it. I'm not a minority. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have the right to say, oh, you can't wear a headdress or have dreads. That's not my yes. shoes. If anything, that would be even worse for me to state that, that I have an opinion on that and I have a right to have an opinion on that. Just as mm -hmm. I don't know if I really should have that great an opinion on what you should do uh, when with your mental health because that's not an mm -hmm. area I'm well versed in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I completely agree there. Like, you know, uh, it, it, I, I, it, it should be for professionals really to, to take yeah. the lines on that. Not everyone is... Uh, you know, suddenly well versed to talk about these issues in depth and, and with the proper evidence and, and whatever. And obviously, everyone tries to. You know, everyone wants to slice the pie. Everyone wants to sound like they've done their reading or whatever. You know, in the end, like we should use the proper channels for these things. Like I'm not. I think the risk sometimes is that, like, if the wrong voice, if I, if what I would refer to as sort of like unauthorized cacophonous voices, you know, like tend to take a line on something, like it can put people off. Um, I remember actually having the discussion uh, uh, possibly with someone about, um, like, for example, the climate crisis, right? You know, like everyone kind of recognizes the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the importance of the issue and whatever. But for me, like Greta Thunberg just puts me off at it. You know, like, this is what I mean about like authority and speakership. Uh, like, I don't, like, people on university campuses that sound like this and speak up about black lives and, you know, like the white as day and, you know, <laughs> probably never like, do you know what I mean? Like there's just some sort of inherent irony in it. Uh, and it's, it's in the same way. Yeah. Like the relationship then between speakership and authority is really important to me. Like I care about these causes on a fundamental level. Yeah, it's yeah, just exactly. when, when you get like someone who like stands up and is prepared to be vocal about it, like you have to question why they're being vocal about it. Like, is it for the cause or is it so that they can project their profile? You know, like what, what is it about? So they can get really? a leg up in whatever their, 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 uh -huh. in whatever their career is sort of thing. Exactly, yeah. Like I think on a baseline care about the cause, you know, on the baseline, of course, black lives matter. I'm not even, I'm not even, that's not as a fucking non-issue. Like yeah. I think you just don't bother dealing with people. Who, well, I mean, I certainly don't. Like, I, I wouldn't stalk internet forums to just, like, debate <laughs> people that, you know, have, like, toxic views or whatever. But, mm. you know, some people have a lot of time on their hands and, and, and shite. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, speakership and authority, really important relationship. Um, I, I don't, you know, really, like, again, you can have the position. You just don't have to agree with, like, the poster boy of these uh, movements or whatever, mm. poster boy, poster girl. You know, like, you're allowed to say... I don't like, you know, Greta Thunberg, or I don't like, you know, whoever speaks for Black Lives Matter. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm petering out again. I have, have a sip of water sort of thing. But I think the point is somewhere in that. No, I, I totally agree with you. I, I mean, I think we're on the same page, that we both mm -hmm. agree that most of these matters are matters that are justifiable. Black Lives mm -hmm. do matter. And the, I suppose the mm -hmm. movement itself does it does matter, but again, the people who have the loudest voices in these these um, movements are often maybe they're, the best to be. No, they're not the best speakers. They're not the most authorized speakers. Yeah, uh, and they're not like most of them just aren't even black. You know, like they're just yeah, trying to build yeah. solidarity for the generation of social kudos on their own basis. Like if they didn't do that, then it would obviously make them look terrible. Um, you know, um, which I think is their chief concern. Now, now that we're really getting into sort of um, mental health, I, I think I've, mm. I've, there are a lot of parallels between mental and physical mm. health that I, I guess I never really paid attention to. I mean, mm -hmm. if, I, if, if you cut your, your hand on a knife, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you came to me and you said, Tom, I cut my hand on a knife. I could give you a plaster, a little band-aid, cover up the mm -hmm. knife, you're fine. Mm -hmm. If you have a little problem like that, 
that's going on inside your head, then yeah, your friends probably could help you out. That could mm -hmm. fix the problem quite quickly. But if that cut is now uh, festering with tetanus and terrible mm -hmm. diseases, I'm no longer the best person to go to. I'm not even in the top 10. I'm, I'm useless now. I've become completely useless. There are yes. professionals that can deal with that problem, just as there are professionals that can deal with the same problems that happen internally. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess that's maybe, I, I mean, I'm not trying to dictate anyone's life. I'm not trying to say this is the viewpoint everyone should have, but I guess it's, you have now made me realize in this moment that that is a good perspective to have. It's a good perspective to not just say, yeah, just go talk to your mates and everything will be fine because that's, that's actually quite bad yeah. to be given people. It's not very useful. Uh, well, yeah, there is, there is, a, te mm -hmm. there is a tension degree. between it. I think, obviously, it's the duty of friendship to provide a level of support, as you said. Mm -hmm. So you're, the analogy you've used about, you know, like providing a blaster or whatever, mm -hmm. like some sort of care for you, you know, some level of it. Mm. But exactly, you know, if you if, if it was a gangrenous cut or I don't know if you'd mm. lost a leg or something exactly. like you need to go and see about that elsewhere. And I know I'm guilty of it. You know, I can like everyone is responsible for their own life insofar as they can be. And you need to go and seek that help sort of thing. It's whether I suppose that I mean, the, the caveat, sorry, this is this is the one point I make is that obviously mental health provision in the UK is poor you know um, yeah, yeah, like within exactly. within within like the university system uh and within the nhs like it's poor unless you're you know demonstrating sort of suicidal ideation or whatever it's going to take a long time for you to see a therapist if it isn't back door so yeah i absolutely want to stand up and say you know like fucking get out of my inbox or get out of my face with your your mental illness pitch sort of thing you know because of course like everyone should try and do what they can you know, for themselves and everyone should use the proper channels. Um, but I just think the follow up comment uh, comment is, is, is that it, there are faults in the system as well. Like the, you can understand why people sometimes begin to feel quite helpless and despairing uh, at the system um, because it's, it's not always that robust. And of course it tends to favor, um, you know, people that would have access to private uh, healthcare sort of thing. Cause it is really only those who are like, you know, having those sort of really suicidal thoughts and whatever, you know, that tend to be bumped up the list sort of thing. And I suppose indeed like the fact that there is a list that's that long is also kind of, you know, a testament to, to how, uh, how much that service needs improving sort of thing. But yeah, on principle, I would agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think again, yeah, fundamentally that the, the, the system for mental health is broken. It, it, mm -hmm. It's just, yeah. It just doesn't work very well the way it's set up right now. Um, I mean, I, I know people personally that have been on waiting lists for years mm -hmm. for things. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, if you were on a waiting list for years and you had cancer, that would yeah, be, that would be catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I get it's just not perceived to be the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same urgency to it. Yeah. yeah. And it should. Yeah. Um, that was a great conversation. Let's go on to another sort of side tangent. Um, oh, great. Side subject. Tell mm -hmm. me about your project. Uh, the last gasps of a sad dying man. Uh, um, the faces of Glasgow. Um, yeah. Well, um, this sort of began again in the, in the earlier stages of, um, of lockdown. I'm just going to say, I'm going to get tangible. I'm doing this, you know, get the vitamin C in, uh, whatever. Uh, yes, uh, this is, um, I mean, I did a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm so shy as well. Like, I don't know why I bother with theatre, you know. I absolutely hate theatre cunts as well. They're just absolutely <laughs> stuffed full of themselves. But I do, I have a very, like, specific, you know, dramatic vision and whatever, and, you right. know, I'd like to, to realise it. I think the term I used earlier was sing for your supper. You know, like that's what you've got to do across society sort of thing. You've got to speak loudly, you know, and that, that can be hard if, you know, like, you know, you can't even win an argument over 
not that we had a dinner table in my house, but you know, like if you can't even, you know, <laughs> we did, we just never sat at it. <laughs> Unhappy family sort of thing. No, but if you can't even speak over, over the nuclear family, then how are you going to speak over the rest of society sort of thing? Uh, but be that as it may, you know, um, we got this, we got this thing started. Uh, it was going to go to the fringe this year, but obviously pandemic hit. What the fuck? Uh, the play's written. Uh, well, it, it, sorry, it began as a play. Uh, I should say, but it's sort of evolved uh, slightly right, now. Right. Um, and essentially, it's it's kind of just a play that um, that for me, like, very much cuts against a lot of the notions of Glasgow that are built up and emboldened by the likes of the university, the likes of sort of institutions in the city that want to rehabilitate mm, right, okay. Glasgow's uh, reputation. Mm. Uh, as a city and as a centre of learning. I mean, it is all of these things. I don't doubt it, but I've been stuck here for 20 years and I fucking hate the place. <laughs> um, you know, mm, good orange. Um, you no, know, you mentioned you're going to Spain. Like, everyone at some point is desirous of change. Mm. Everyone at some point wants to see something that isn't fucking Sainsbury's across the road. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, uh, this is kind of this is all i've really got to work with is my uh you know experiences here what i've seen as sort of uh, the term the french term for it is flaneur uh uh you know someone that observes society and culture like that's that's it that's what i grew up in that's what i've seen but i think it's a vision of the city sorry that's often not presented as much maybe to some extent in like have you ever heard of chewing the fat mm, yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I used to absolutely love that because it was just scabrous and vile and like, he's a fag, you know, it was all the worst parts of being a Glaswegian. You know, but actually, in a sense, like, it's the only literary part for me, um, of, like, excepting obviously Alistair Gray and, you know, the actual literary giants of the city. Like, it's the other side of it. It's like the dark yeah. underbelly that, right, yeah. that, you know, that exists on the buses uh, and, you know, that like very much like is culturally alive here across like almost every facet of society uh, and I just I feel like apart from you know the likes of Limmy maybe chewing the fat not even still game I think still game got quite tame on that one um that kind of ridiculous brand of humor mm-hmm. uh that like you know potty mouth vulgarity like yeah, yeah. passion shit and clunge and you know just absolute awful hasn't really been done justice to and so this is where I sort of begin to marry you know, my first version of literariness, which is that sort of high diction, that like, you know, beautiful courtly poetry, the greats of English literature, and then even earlier in the French chansons and whatever, but slap that together with like absolute Glasgow bam patter, you know, and call it a play. Um, And I don't know if anything quite like this sort of, you know, thing has been done before, where there's such a modulation in register, where there's such a like horrific, a sense of high and low sitting together because that's what this is about for me is um like high and low culture sitting together together because that's what glasgow is to me in a sense is this wonderful juxtaposition mm. or tapestry of high and low of, mm. you know whether that being sort of socioeconomic status or culture or whatever like all these areas are just sort of jammed together in a sort of you know like frankensteinian nightmare mm-hmm. um and that, to me, is Glasgow. And then so trying to transpose that into a play um, has, has been a labour of love and piss and shame uh, that began in the early stages of lockdown and, and very much continues. I mean, we are all clear that I am not fit to lead myself, you know, out the door across to Tesco, never mind a theatre project that's sort of now multinational or whatever. But, you know, we're enjoying it sort of thing. Like, I think only Glasgow could have spawned something as irritating uh, as me and and this cast and whatever and no i've been very i've been very touched by by all the um because I, I again i don't like you know standing up and presenting my work a lot unless there's like something really important or personal like that demands it not no i don't mean as in i like sharing the personal for the sake of the personal like absolutely not but i mean as in like 
I don't know, the first time I stood up and did a poem was when, you know, at like 20, you know, I'd been pied for the first time romantically sort of thing. Well, that made me stand up and, you know, I have that sort of human experience sort of thing. Mm. But this is the same thing where I'm actually beginning for a moment just to put my sort of weird experiences of being human to, ex to an extent in this city to, to paper and to bear uh, in a performative way. Uh, and sorry, to just sort of summarise the play, you know, I brought together all sorts of people that I met I was growing up at the Citizens Theatre, um, you know, um, all across the city, like essentially, sorry, the, the, the pitch was like every cunt I've ever met suddenly gets on a Zoom call um, and we try and uh, and we try and make something out of this. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, no, I've been very touched by by the response, you know, like we've, we've had uh, uh, some pretty successful actors actually join us. I, I don't know if you know Janie Godley. She was on Have I Got News For You yesterday, oh, really? actually. I'd recommend that. Yeah. Oh. I said, I'm one, I'm one away for Have I Got News For You. And I think I'd be good on Have I Got News For You as well. It's just I don't like speaking or the sound of my own voice. But um, no, 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 no. Um, uh, there's a woman called Susan Sims who's just, you know, like the absolute embodiment of what it means to be Glaswegian, just this waspy woman that says like pretty much anything. Um, and she's she's got Netflix credits and whatever. She's uh, she's part of the the cast. She's um, well, sorry, I should I should probably give a sort of synopsis or a, a or an introduction to the play. I mean, the play is um, the play is this sort of sketch based interstitial thing with a central narrative, and the central narrative is about uh, well, William of Orange and the Orange Lodge and how Orange culture in Glasgow realizes that it's kind of on the back foot and is trying to reassert its relevancy in sort of you know. Uh, 21st century Britain or whatever so we sort of start in the Orange Lodge with the Grand Master saying you know like how are we gonna how are we gonna pierce through you know like why why are they trying to ban our, our marches etc that how are we going to address the falling support for this order um, and of course there are lots of women in the lodge and they're like all right well you know we'll bash more Catholics so we'll you know um, you know they're just coming up with ridiculous suggestions and then eventually they all settle on right well we're, we're gonna return to our roots and resurrect William of Orange and so there's this huge process with sketches in between uh, where they go about sort of, um, I don't know, it's a bit like the sort of Egyptian myth of Osiris where he was like chopped up and put in different pieces. You've got all these like, uh, you know, canopic jars. Uh, like in, in this case, we've got like a bottle of slow gin from the Netherlands. Uh, uh, we've got like a pube from William of Orange or something that was found in Hampton Court Palace. And all of these essences come together uh, and he's resurrected. And, you know, the Orange Order is amazed. Like, here he is. It's our leader back, except there's one small problem. He comes back, but kind of as a run-of-the-mill, like, Glaswegian pufta or Glasgay. So he just sort of walks out of, like, a sort of glass sarcophagus, and he's like, eh, eh, eh. I haven't had a fucking manicure since the 17th century, boys. How's it going? And then obviously then it's just playing that off again. It's like the hard lodge master like king billy what is this you know sort of thing like there's a lot of there's a lot of good conflict on the stage and i think it's very funny it's well i, I hope so anyway it's a very aggressive on the nose like cock and arse satire but it's 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 my style um and yes no, i'd very much like to uh to to take it to the fringe sort of thing um of course theaters are shut at the moment so we're very limited in what we can do there is a trailer for it out on on the YouTube channel sort of thing. Um, I just don't really like, you know, doing it online sort of thing. Like, again, it plays back into my sort of uh, original sensibilities as a performer where it has to be kind of a private audience, where it has to kind of be like a private performance. Like, I'd like to see people's reactions Perfect. live then and there. And that's obviously something that the coronavirus problematizes, uh, you know, kind of indefinitely. Um, but, but yeah, this is this is my show. This is, I think, uh, there's nothing quite like it, I hope. And I mean that, like, that's for good or ill. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, I very much look forward to, to sort of directing, perhaps even acting in it sort of thing, uh, and seeing, you know, what kind of attention we could attract. We've been very touched by the response so far, and we're, you know, just waiting to see uh, where it goes. I'll certainly have a lot of time to work on it uh, from, 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 from the sedentary position, if I do wish to, etc. But, yeah, no, in essence, it really is just about putting a sort of hitherto, I think, untapped version of Glasgow on show, you know, one that doesn't always make it into the, the cultural consciousness or like, you know, the prim and proper BBC presented version, but absolutely exists and is still there. And for my part, you know, I've been, I've been absolutely loving it. You know, um, I've been, uh, there's a fantastic line from Susan, uh, which I think for me is the line of the play uh, uh, for me. Uh, and it's when, um, uh, it's when, uh, 
the Lodge Master describes uh, something of the approach that the Order is going to take to resistance about extreme violence or something. And Susan Sims, who speaks like this, pipes up and says, Lodge Master, can I be excused? Everything you just said there, especially the bit about extreme violence. Fuck's sake, I'm creaming harder than the Queen's clunge on the death of Princess Diana at the hands of MI6. It's just, it's completely no nonsense, won't stop, it's out of order. Um, and I just, I honestly think that kind of thing deserves the funding and attention that it will no doubt get, you know. Because um, look at that reaction, look at that live <laughs> reaction. Like, think, think what that would do to absolute theatre yards, you know. Think what that would do to British sensibilities uh, more widely. Uh, and of course, for it to come from, because that's it, appearances and reality can be quite divorced. It can be quite deceiving. You know, I can sit here and intellectualize all this pish, but when the, when, when the truth is out, you know, like people still stand. I mean, it was the same in Shakespeare's day, you know, like, you know, any sort of scatological humor, any sort of talk of that, like you've got to put something in for all the audience members. You've got to put something in that's funny. And I just think that's funny across the board. Like I think even those at the higher strata of society will raise a cackle at that sort of thing, you know? Um, so hopefully uh, it's got a cross-cultural appeal, but we'll see. I still think this needs to be heard. I still think it needs to be seen. I don't think you can have a polished version of Glasgow because Glasgow isn't polished. You can't polish. Like Glasgow is not just the West End. It's the fucking rest of us, mm -hmm. you know? This um, and yeah. incredible to me. Yeah, you're taking two extremes, you're mashing them together, you're creating this sort of mm. concoction, this cocktail. Mm. I love that. It's, it sounds funny. It sounds well. It's a threat, I think, it to sensibilities. Political. It's a threat to people, but it's it's like nascently or subtly political, I think, because mm. I don't if I like being sort of openly political. But but it's there, and it's I I hope. I hope it will resonate. It's just a case of, you know, getting it out there and spreading the word sort of thing, um, which I'm often terrible at doing myself. So I need to, I need my ladies in waiting to do that sort of thing. But no, I think it absolutely deserves to be heard and, and seen. And I hope it will be because Glasgow isn't perfect. No city is perfect. Every mm -hmm. city, of course, has its, you know, like social ills and its underbellies and whatever. But Glasgow has a particularly unique psyche. Um, and I just think that needs to, that really needs to be shown. Like, I, I don't think you can forever uh, run with this notion of, of, of Glasgow being, you know, like this beautiful haven or whatever, you know, it's a post-industrial shitter to some, and that version of it needs to be, needs to be disseminated in some way. Um, and I don't think that's doing it an injustice. Like I was born in Glasgow. I live and breathe Glasgow. Like Glasgow is written into my skin and my bones and how I speak and how I am and how I dress and how I think. If anyone has earned a right to throw Glasgow under the bus, a first bus at that, then I think it's me. Brilliant. Where can people get more information on this? So um, we have a YouTube channel. Um, we also have a Facebook page. We've got an Instagram sort of thing. Um, uh, but in the meantime, uh, uh, I believe we've also got a, a Patreon as well, but you don't have to support us see, as long as you're in sympathy with us. You know, in our political claims, I'm not really bothered, <laughs> etc. Those are the places where you can certainly find out more about the project. And Obviously, we are looking at Glasgow, yes. They're all faces of Glasgow. I think the Instagram is faces of Glasgow, but you know, you would probably get it if you typed yeah, it in, sort of that? thing. Um, but yeah, no, these uh, these are these are sort of our outlets. Uh, we're still very much in the in the early stages. Like lockdown has certainly affected what everyone's been able to do. Certainly for creative professionals, like the the impact has been you know, absolutely immense. Um, people have got to take what paid what they can, etc. So we're kind of in a, 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 a sort of re, um, recapitulation phase of the project where we're looking at reapplying for creative grants and reapplying. The difficulty, of course, is that it's difficult to be true to this vision of Glasgow that might be problematic for some people. You know, like the difficulty is you're going to offend people. The difficulty is this isn't perfect. This isn't airbrushed. This isn't mm -hmm. necessarily going to attract people to the city. But at the same time, this obviously needs to be seen, um, in my opinion. You know, like people do find it funny, I think. Um, and I just, yeah, like this is not a perfect city, but this is about kind of taking a step back and, and laughing at it as Glaswegians and perhaps people beyond have a right to do, you know, like where is satire you know that's a lot of the discussions we had earlier like some people just don't perhaps i'm overly conscious of it a lot of the time which is why i don't do anything like i'm overly conscious of how criticizable i might become but you know like everyone 
can be you know taken the mick out of every city can have the mick taken out of it all its inhabitants can have the mick taken out of it and that's kind of what this strives to do like it's a no-nonsense swipe yep. kind of at everyone like everyone is getting a pot shot at them you know no one's free from it and that's what i, I like about it if, if you do get offended by it you've sort of missed the, the point of missed it. the point of it yes yeah. well um, exactly because i'm sorry like the whole top team is poofs and you know, <laughs> fannies and, you know, like whatever, like we, and trans people, you know, that we do have a very diverse top team, etc. I think that the idea of it is putting, um, and again, this just cuts back to kind of everything that I've been saying, like someone's experience in a category of, you know, so-called oppression, like you, you have a number of ways to run with that. You know, you can either like harden your stance against like everyone else you can come down like a culling blade on the rest of society and fight your corner at every turn sort of thing like you're a homophobe you're this you're that you know these are unfounded statements like people just have lives to lead you know people have their own interests you know fucking it's a hobbesian state of nature pish out there you know um and this is our response to it sorry like we feel that we've kind of earned the right certainly i as i presume a homosexual man have earned the right to sort of deal with it in in this way you know by like taking the mick out of it by you know, caricaturing William of Orange as, you know, the ultimate, you know, like sort of gay playboy artist or whatever, you know, like taking up the chuff from all the members of the Lodge Master, et cetera, that you can run wild with it. Yeah. If truly the culture of profligacy and that is what they believe in, then why not this play? Is this play not a protrusion of it? Is this play not some sort of protrusion of queerness? It's just inverted through a working class nexus to an extent because there's working class sort of scatological humor. But that isn't to say that the people behind this, the brains behind the operation are intelligent because of course this same play is stuffed with, uh, sorry to, to get very specific in the terminology again, it's stuffed with lines from the Breton lies uh, and 14th century uh, French chivalric poetry and whatever. Like suffusing this play is, as I say, that Frankensteinian influence mm. of high literariness and just lowbrow pish. Mm. Like I can't think of anything else quite like it. Of course I would say that because I was gonna say I'm paid to say that. No, I'm not, I'm not paid to do anything about <laughs> flip myself off to Trisha Goddard sort of thing. But you know, like this is a unique brand and I think it threatens the security of theater goers. I think it threatens the security of audiences and I want to be at the helm of it. Shake things up a bit. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, it's been brilliant speaking to you. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, they're all, all the social medias are Faces of Glasgow. Or yes, Facebook. Faces of Glasgow, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. perfect. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you want to give a shout out to? Anything you want to promote, plug, suggest, recommend? Um, oh, ooh, uh, right. Uh, good, good point. Um, here's something actually I wanted to draw attention to. Because yep. um, this, this, I imagine that the chief demographic for this will perhaps be younger people or perhaps even university students sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things uh, I've uh, sort of, well, when I was allowed to leave the house sort of thing, I was throwing my weight behind a lot was, um, uh, well, a bit of a political consideration, actually, uh, to do with, have you heard of the, the guy, Junaid Ashraf? Uh, no. No, he's running to be rector of the University of Glasgow at the moment, but he's also a sitting councillor. He graduated, I think, the other year from Glasgow University. Right. Uh, anyway. Um, I obviously, I, I mentioned before, I, I grew up in the South Side. Um, um, I've got a local MSP. The Scottish parliamentary elections are coming up uh, in 2021, etc. Everyone can vote, obviously. Um, but no, uh, one of the things that I wanted to draw attention to that perhaps hasn't had enough uh, spotlight thrust on it is that uh, Janaid Ashraf is making a bid for my, my, home seat, uh, my home seat. It's an internal SNP contest. Uh, but he's already a sitting councillor, sorry. Uh, he's running to be rector of the University of Glasgow at the same time, and now he's targeting the 68-year-old incumbent, James Dornan, um, which, you know, I hadn't heard about until like the other week, but this is, to me, quite scandalous, that this is nothing if not a pointed attack. Like, obviously, his team have got around him and like, ho oh, ho, there's James Dornan. He doesn't know how to use social media. Ho oh, ho, there's James Dornan. Let's get the fuck in there. You know, let's get me a national platform quick as possible. Um, I'm quite disgusted by that, and one of the things that I would absolutely want to draw people's attention to is that, uh, that, that Mr. Ashraf, whilst obviously highly qualified and, and highly capable as a public representative, is in this case, you know, just being a cynical git, um, and, you know, like, really ought to think about what he's doing, because um, that, that, sorry, is one other thing that I wish to point out. If Mr. Ashraf wins the internal contest, I, uh, as successor to Lord Buckethead, 
will be standing in the constituency as an independent, um, you know, and I'll be looking forward to submitting my application to the Electoral Commission. So I would say, sorry, if anyone is voting in the constituency of Glasgow Cathcart uh, next year, hopefully Dornan will be in, vote for Dornan, because, you know, there's no real point. In, it, it, again, with the first past the post thing, it's obviously best to get your a good constituency representative. And with Dornan, his, his record has just been exemplary that we've talked obviously about mental health, but this is a 68 year old man who champions that as a backbencher uh, from, from the Scottish Parliament who spars with Ruth Davidson uh, quite effectively. Um, and he's just, you know, a bit of a lad really, you know, if I can put it like that, you know, like he hasn't had nearly the same kind of opportunities that Ashraf has had to travel the world and, mm. and to experience all those sorts of like global political issues. Like Mr. Dornan actually just kind of wants to represent the people of Cathcart. And I think that's what public service fundamentally is about. That no matter what your station, you know, it should be, should be to that constituency link. And I can obviously see Ashraf coming in and problematizing that greatly, which is why, hopefully not, because he'll win the contest and I have absolute faith in Dornan. But if he doesn't, just remember that I will go political next year and stand as an independent. I don't know what my policy platform will be, but perhaps this is something we could explore at a later date from, yeah. from your Spanish villa sort of thing. I would, uh, I would love to have you back on when you're, when you're doing that. As an elected representative sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, That's yeah, no, absolutely. I've given my life to the people of Glasgow, what can I say? <laughs> Um, but on that note, I have to say thank you very much for having me and um, oh, no, no, thank you know, all you. the best.